take you back to the 16th century with a modern twist. Sounds like a crazy nonsense, but that's not the case with Chirabon because here, time is relative. Come see the beauty only on Sea Indonesia. You probably wonder why you should go to Chirabon. Chirabon may sit in the West Java province, however, unlike any other city in West Java, this port city is the only coastal city located about 40 kilometers west of the provincial border of Central Java. Straddling the borders between West and Central Java, Chirabon's history has been influenced by both Sundanese and Javanese cultures, as well as Arabic and Chinese. Chirabon is also the seat of a former sultanate. The oldest palace is the Kasapuhan Palace. Standing at the total land area of 10 hectares, the Kasapuhan Palace is the largest, most impressive and best kept among the Chirabon palaces, where every niche carry its own historic significance. The palace was built in 1447. Here I want to talk about the architecture and interior that are a blend of Sundanese, Japanese, Arabic, Chinese and Dutch styles. You'd find Majapahit off the Javanese influence preserved in its small pendopo on soft carved brick bases. The carving on the pendopo columns are 1940s copies of the ancient originals. Keep walking to a mini garden that features two white tigers that symbolize the Sundanese Pajajaran kingdom legacy. Even though some areas are open to the public, the royal family of Kasapuhan Sultanate still lives here. Therefore, some areas are prohibited. If you're still hungry for more cultural sites, check out the museum. Here you'll find a collection of royal artifacts such as wayang, kris, gamelan instruments, furniture, Portuguese armor and ancient royal clothes. Must see here is a 17th century gilded coach called Kareta Singa Barong. Singa Barong is a mixture of four animals, the body of a tiger, an elephant's trunk, the wings of a Garuda and a dragon's head. Mm, wow. This coach was used by the Sultan to run errands and for ceremonial celebrations. Nowadays, the royal used the replica of Singa Barong that was built in 1995 for the same purpose. From there, let me take you to Kandamat area to understand the life of these Sultanates in the modern era. It starts from here, the Kanoman Market. This is no ordinary market because this market has existed since 1678. To this day, this market is always busy. The economic force has been driven by over thousands of merchants. This is really warm. This is called chico. Hey, ini tuh bumbunya tuh apa? Bumbunya itu dage sama terasi. Dage itu apa? Dage itu tempe yang udah difermentasi kayak ada jamur-jamur itu tapi jamurnya jamur lain. Sama terasi kerbau. Ah, right. You eat this and then you drink this. This is a hot tea. She told me that if you eat this and drink this, you're gonna get kembringat. It's like sweating uncontrollably. Which I am right now. Ooh. Hiding behind the crowd stand walls of bricks shrouded in trees and children's laughter. The Kanoman's Palace. 
I switched my attire into a Baltic frock because I'm about to meet the Kanaman's prince, Pangeran Patih Raja Muhammad Kodiron. Founded by Sultan Anom I in 1677, this palace sits on a six hectares area. This palace has its significance during the Dutch colonial era as a place to gather the resistance. Much like the previous location, the Kanaman royal family resides here as well. They live closer to the local residents, only separated by the squat split gates with pyramidal peaks that are Chiribon emblem. For what it looks like, this palace is more open and somewhat social. Here are two functional rooms. This is a place for the Baya Aksa, and it's called Mandir Jadi ini ada tempat sebagai khusus VIP-nya gitu kan. Dan ini tempat pengobatan Sri Sultan dan mangkatnya Sri Sultan juga. Baik kalau secara fungsi dari masa ke masa mungkin ya Pak. Iya. Dari kesultanan ini sebenarnya fungsinya itu uh, seperti apa? Pasti kan ada perubahan ya Pak. Betul kesultanan sekali, kesultanan betul, juga, betul. Ya? Jadi fungsional uh, kesultanan kami itu sebagai daripada pemangku adat wilayahnya kan gitu kan gitu. Dalam hal ini memang keraton itu memiliki suatu masyarakat adat gitu dan di mana masyarakat itu banyak sekali tempat-tempat yang yang kira masih teritori kekuasaannya gitu. Dan fungsional ini adalah sebagai siar agama Islam dan siar sebagai budaya juga gitu. Dan terus ke ekonomi, politik dan sebagainya gitu. Jadi sekarang ini sebagai daripada tetap uh, pemukul adat ini masih kental dan sebagai fungsi sebagai daripada cagar budaya dan sebagai pesiar Islam dan hanya segala daripada melakukan kegiatan-kegiatan yang ada after he took me around the area, he said he had a special cultural performance prepared to welcome us. Hmm, gamelan players and dancers are lining up neatly. There's a dome-shaped cage covered in fabric, incense burning to cleanse the area. Oh, what is this really? Ah, this is a folk art called Sindren. Sindren dance is a traditional Chirabon dance that was also developed in the coastal areas of West Java and Central Java. Some said this dance has a magical element in it. This art is originally known in the early 1940s. Sindren actually means a virgin dancer who becomes the main star attraction. The development has something to do with the modesty of coastal life. This was a kind of sacred game they played while waiting for the fishermen to come home. But in its development, it becomes an elaborate art performance that combines traditional music, dance and magical performance, so to speak. Because the core of the show is the ritual of summoning a spirit to enter the Sintren's body. While in fainting state, she is then wrapped in a wick carpet tied with ropes and put inside the cage. And this is when the magic enters the scene. The singer and the shaman would recite a mantra to summon the spirit of an angel. And somehow, when they lift up the cage, like a skilled escapologist, the Sintren dancer is already dressed up, complete with the black sunglasses. Then she dances freely. The dance movement looks like one who is left by its spirit. It is monotonous with a stiff and empty gesture. But this is the unique part. Try. This is called Sauer, so I'm going to throw some money at her and she's going to stop the dance. I got goosebumps because she's actually possessed. Despite the mystical aspect, Prince Kodiron explained to me that the dance actually represents human lust when it comes to wealth. When the dancer falls due to getting hit by the money, it symbolizes wealth or money, which could become a human's downfall. Behind every mystery, there's a belief and human beliefs may contradict the nature of reality. 
apart from the presence or absence of magical elements in the art, still, this art is quite interesting to watch and experience. See the beauty? Only on Seen in Asia! Another art form that stood the test of time in Chirabon is batik. The best place to learn about it is in Trusmi Batik village. The village of Trusmi is located in the town of Pleret, four kilometers west of the city of Chirabon. Historically, since the 15th century, the village has been the center of batik production. I wanted to know more about the distinct batik motifs of Chirabon, so I met Sri Widya Stuti, the supervisor at Bete Batik Trusmi Batik Museum. Widya explained that in general, Chirabon motifs can be categorized into five Wadasan, Geometric, Pangkaan, Pyur, and Semarangan. Wadasan is the royal motifs. They use Kraton's ornaments in the batik patterns such as Singa Payung. Nagasaba and the most famous one is Mega Mendung. Kalau Mega Mendung, Mega itu kan awan. Kalau Mendung kan itu mengharapkan hujan. Mega Mendung itu kan mengharapkan tanaman yang tumbuh itu subur. Jadi kalau dominan awan kan hujan, tanaman tumbuh subur. Uh, di sini kan pesisiran juga dong. Iya, benar. <laughs> nah, cuman apa sih bedanya kayak pesisiran di sini dengan pekalongan dan mungkin batik pesisiran lainnya? Benar. Kalau untuk pesisiran Cirebon di dominan warnanya ngedrek. Paduan warnanya. Oh iya, ya kontrasnya gitu. Iya, ya. benar. Orange, hijau, tabrak lari ya paduan warnanya tuh ngejreng. Oh. Tuh kalau daerah lain tuh biasanya warnanya lebih soft. Coastal batik motifs also celebrate the melange of culture, making it vibrant, rich with intricate details. Today, the Trusmi batik has helped boost tourism to Chirabon. Along the 1.5 km main road, you will find rows of batik Trusmi stores and showrooms lining up the streets, showcasing their finest products. And for many years, the Chirbon batik industry was supported by over thousands of batik artisans in the area. Widi takes me to Kalitanga village, where Bete batik trusmi batik were made. The process here are all handmade. What the man is doing is called the batik chap method, in which design are applied in wax with chap stamps. They're usually made of copper for its heat conductive properties and are used to print hot wax onto cotton. The wax stamping method is the best way to create geometrical patterns and produce repetitive designs. Batik made like this has been produced in Java since the middle of the 19th century to speed up the production and lower the cost of batik cloth. And the other method is batik tulis which is the oldest form of batik making in Indonesia, where the wax is written or drawn onto a length of fabric. For every batik fabric like this, it, it was handled by at least seven talented hands, each with specific task. And what she's doing right now, this is called nembok, or covering certain area to block out the dye during the colouring process. Hence why batik can come in many different colours. Then come the colouring process called nyeluk. The colour soaking process can take days or even months depending on the complexity of batik designs. Naturally, the batik price for artisanal projects such as these have a bigger value on the market. Now you know how they are made, it's time to explore the showroom and break that bank. <laughs> Bete Batik Trusmi was started as a small family business. It was first opened in 2007 by Sally Giovanni and her husband. This big showroom, however, opened in 2011 after the success in popularizing Batik to the younger audience. And this 1.5 hectare area features not only the showroom, but you can also enter the museum too. Oh, I saw something. 
I like this. So I passed through here and I saw this. I'm like, this is so gorgeous. I'm not sure what this is. It's a bib. It's a vest probably. <laughs> How about this one? It's a bit prairie, you know. I like prairie so much. The braid hair. Do you want something fancier? Go to the exclusive collection area. The collection here is mostly limited edition and made by Batik Toli's process. I like the Peter Pan collar, makes it a little bit 1960s. Apart from clothes, there are also shoes, accessories, and my favorite bags. Which one do you think I should get? This one or this one? I mean, I love Batik and I love wicker bag. This is a dilemma. So cheap, guys. This is only like 75,000 rupiah. I mean, for this, look how nice this is. Obviously, the color is really gorgeous. I'm gonna take this one. For people in Trusmi, Batiks surely has shaped them into who they are. The artists would always create new things, enriching and preserving the age-old culture while keeping the economy wheel spinning, particularly Chirabo. See the beauty only on Seen in Asia. Back to Chirabon. How did Chirabon get its name? Being on the border of Sundanese and Javanese cultural regions, many of Chirabon's residents speak a dialect that is a mix of Sundanese and Javanese known as Jawara. It is said that the word Chirabon derives from the Sundanese word Charuban, meaning mixed, a reference to the city's mix of cultural elements. According to the manuscript of Purwaka Charuban Nagari, Chirabon started as a small fishing village in the 15th century named Muara Jati, which attracted foreign traders. Tome Pires, in his book Sumo Oriental, around the year 1513, mentioned that Chirabon was one of the trade centers on the island of Java. After Chirabon was taken over by the Dutch East Indies government in 1859, it was designated as a transit port for import-export goods and the result of years and years of acculturation can be tasted in their rich culinary heritage. In Indonesia, people would associate Chirabon with its local dish called Umpal Gentong. Umpal Gentong is a spicy Indonesian curry-like beef soup that has been around since the 15th century to spread Islam. Back then, when Hinduism was the majority, Umpal Gentong was used with buffalo meat instead of beef. But over time, the ingredients change and the beef is used. Similar to gulai, that is usually cooked with firewood in a clay pot stove, the ingredients include cuts of beefs and cow offals, or the broth that consists of coconut milk that has been seasoned with herbs and spices and simmered for over four hours. The dish is later finished off with a dash of chives as garnish. So this is the result or perfect example of acculturation in Chirabot. Because in this warm bowl of, I don't know, I guess in several regions this is look like soto, but here this is called umpaldipo. So the broth, so you can see it's yellowy. It's in a curry broth, which is quite inspired by the Indian and also Arab culture that evolves around here. Meanwhile, the seasoning itself is quite thin, you know, much like the Chinese and Japanese cuisine. And also the filling or the toppings, I must say. You can get like meat and also offals if you're really into that kind of thing. And I think that's quite uh, Chinese as well, you know, eating offals. Apart from the curry broth, you can also order a pal asam. It is a clear sour broth made out of Afiora blimbi from a small tropical tree. Apart from the embal gandong, you can also try the nasi jamblang, which is 
the Kirban version of Nasi Champur or rice with multiple side dishes. However, what I want to try tonight is a dish that was an original creation from 1945 called Mikotlok. And this is Mikotlok Panjunan. The place looks quite humble like this, but look at the line, right? I have to make sure that I'm gonna chewing up and get my noodle. I want my noodle now. This dish is usually served at night and it seems like this is the Tirobos people's favorite, judging from how long I should wait for a seat inside the shop. In the meantime, I'm gonna try this snack called gonji. Gonji, is it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mm. Mm. You should try it. Oh, gosh, I'm so ready to try the noodle. Oh, so this is the first time for me to try Mikotchlok. And some said that the name Kotchlok refers to the way the broth made. Gosh, looks like we have to shake it. Mm, it smells really nice. Oh, nice. I think it has some kind of a coconut tea in it. The dish is somewhat like a cross between noodles and chicken porridge. Made of chicken broth and coconut milk soup, which is coagulated with cornstarch or tapioca. Other ingredients include shredded chicken breast, cabbage, bean sprout, hard boiled leg, and kefir lime juice. The dish is sprinkled with sliced fresh celery, spring onion, and spring shallot. I mean, it's raining outside right earlier. So, this warm plate of noodles. Chirabon's journey now has come full circle by coming down to a dance festival in Chirabon and Palace. This is a celebration of one of the most notable dance groups in Chirabon, the Sakar Pandan. People of all ages come and perform. I feel quite nostalgic. I imagine how it must have been like to live in the olden days where entertainment used to be visceral like this. <laughs> <laughs> 